So what is the optimal rider position? There is much debate and uh, it continues. The most efficient, it would appear, for flat work, particularly dressage, is for the rider to be in a standing kneeling position. So don't think of the rider as being seated. I think that's what is wrong with a lot of riding positions where it's easy to consider that we just have to sit there when in fact when we're talking about the ridden posture it should feel more like standing or kneeling so that if we took the horse away from the rider they would land on the ground standing up And the joint alignment for balance is the Atlanto occipital joint, so the region where the head joins onto the spine, the shoulder joint, the hip joint, and the ankle joint. But that's not the whole story. And this divides the body into equal halves in each plane. So if this is the sagittal plane looking from the side, this is the horizontal plane looking from directly above. And this is the frontal plane where we can see from behind or in front. And in each of these planes, each of these joints, atlanto-occipital, shoulder, hip, ankle have to be aligned so that from front to back there should be as much of the rider's body on one side as there is on the other symmetrically and looking from above those rotations should be neutral so that the hip one hip is not more protracted than the other and the same for the shoulders which are sighted above the pelvis the rider should not have one shoulder in advance of the other because this will affect the loading down through and into the saddle so that the rider has a vertically stacked mobile spine loading the horse's horizontal bouncing beam so just imagine that in order for the rider to be stable and balanced, they must be loaded symmetrically in all three planes. They should not be leaning too far forward or back. They should not be rotated through the shoulders, ribs or hips, pelvis, and they should not be leaning left or right everything should be centralized central central around the axis and central and this requires that the equine spine is also in neutral rotation for those precision movements. And I'll show you that a little later, but for the equine accommodating the rider, they require a neutral spine also. And for skilled riders, they have a closer coupling and tighter synchrony with the horse's movements. And with this, there is a reduction in the variability of the horse's movements. So in other words, a still rider will result in a more still stable horse. There will be less noise or perturbance in the horse's movement as a result. Consider that more than 50% of the rider 
in other words, their upper body is precariously unstable. So this is supported, this is not. And the rider is supported by the lower body in the main, whether that's a three point seat or a two point. And the stirrups will aid whole body stability in all movement planes, we would hope. As long as the ankle is stable, there is added control that can be exerted from the pelvis from above by the torso. So we're not just seated on a horse. There are some important intrinsic control mechanisms at play, both coming from above in this unstable upper body structure and from below from unstable ankles and both will affect the intrinsic control of the pelvis loaded onto the saddle. The rider weight force can vary with postural positioning. That's fairly self-explanatory. The position of the rider can be aided or inhibited by saddle design, and we'll look at that shortly. And rider posture, skill and stability impacts on vertical wither movement. So there you have it. The rider can readily inhibit the horse's ability to push up vertically. I just want to point out there that on this course, we will be putting a lot more focus on vertical wither movement uh, together with lumbosacral flexion. So this is not just about getting the hinds under the horse. It's about seeing if the rider is not or, or if the rider is facilitating vertical with a movement. So just bear that in mind. And the more the horse's spine is loaded, the greater will be the spinal extension. And in that posture, forelimb retraction will be greater. So in other words, when the spine is loaded into a position of extension, the horse will use a pulling strategy with the forelimbs to maintain gait. And that's what gives us stilted movement. Uh, particularly in the canter, which is something that Dr. Sue Dyson refers back to quite often, that it's not normal for a horse to have a stilted canter gait, but clearly there's something going on in the back and the horse is compensating, possibly lameness because, you know, that's, that's what she sees the most, but it, it is a sign that there is a lot not right with the horse when you see stilted gait and not that flowing gait that you saw earlier in the spotty horse. And it's the stilted gait that we saw in the last week's presentation of the horse uh, who's had the load altered by me making the rider asymmetrical. And this is an interesting one. The more years you spend riding dressage and the more competent and skilled you become as a dressage rider, the greater the pelvic asymmetry, which is a surprising finding. You would think that the rider would become more symmetrical as they have to or learn how to produce more symmetry, functional symmetry in the horse but we cannot assume that. So even though a rider may declare themselves competent, skilled, elite, those are the ones we should 
be focusing on, perhaps more so than the novice rider. So nobody escapes this posture evaluation. What do you think of that? What's your experience? Have you any experience of that? So that it's almost like saying that the more, the more you ride dressage, the more experience you get, that perhaps the the stiffer you get, the the more difficult it is to ride. Um, tricky one. Does does anyone agree? Disagree? Does that fit with your experience? Oh, uh, from a saddle fitter, it's harder to correct dressage riders. That's that's really interesting. Uh, you only get older when you ride many years. Yeah. Yeah, it could be age, could be age. <laughs> uh, people are stiffer. They learned tricks and mannerisms. I often see that the saddle or horse combination, sometimes it makes it impossible to sit properly. Yes, yes, we will be looking at that because we do, on this course, we do put the riders in their saddles and, and see what's going on. Brilliant. OK, so it is it's a mystery, but but keep it in mind that you cannot assume that the elite dressage riders and we don't know if it's the same for, for jumping. We don't know if the more the horse progresses, that perhaps the more asymmetrical they get. Hmm. That wouldn't be my experience, actually. Uh, because I find the more advanced the dressage horse, the more fluent their movement is. But we'll have to look into that a bit more. And with the pelvic asymmetry comes reduced lateral flexion. And a simple equation for this is that reduced lateral flexion means greater functional asymmetry and greater functional asymmetry equates to the increased potential for back pain so it's really not unusual to find that many riders have musculoskeletal pain in the lower body which can be caused by riding and you'll be surprised when you start evaluating these riders and asking questions and putting them on saddle horses instead of horses and asking them to perform uh, different activities. You will be amazed at how many have hip pain. And we'll take a look at a more detailed exploration of that in this short video. There's a lot of riders, a lot of people have sprained one ankle, for example. Yeah. So they have this, if you look at the moving towards you on a horse, yeah. one ankle would be different to the other. Uh, the left ankle looks weaker. It's the one you're also inclined to use the most. So when they're doing rising trot. Yeah, it so they're collapsing right. through the ankle and it's not collapsing yeah. through the arch. Yeah, because humans, we're putting our weight and our force through the balls of our feet in the stirrups. And then coincidentally, the ankle is the first joint of movement. The ankle is fundamental in terms of how the body moves from the ankle upwards so if there is any lateral deviation of the ankle all of a sudden that means that you are destined to then rise asymmetrically okay i thought i'd done a little bit of voodoo uh, well, a couple of weeks ago when i just put a, a rolled up shim or pad under the femur where the saddles yeah. never support the rider yeah. and that corrected the ankle stability and i need to fix the rotation on your left hip 
sorry, this is the rider with the pad under the femur. So just watch what happens. So just come to walk a moment. And then with your left hip, let's see if you can rotate it a little and see how that feels with the padding. So rather than bring the right hip back, bring the left one forward. Left one back or forward. Right one forward. Uh, well, no, left, left one is back. I want the left one forward. Because okay. that's your weak one. Yep. Let's see how we can alter that r left side. Now, do you want me to take the right pad off you? Uh, yeah, I'm not as keen on the right. Okay. How does that feel? Yeah, I feel even now. Feel even? Wow. Okay. How do your ankles feel now that I've padded the left? Yeah. Do you think we've quietened them down? Yeah. I think so too. But it completely resolved that issue. So just really getting the others to definitely make a point of looking at ankles. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the ankle, there's various laws which Einstein and and various people have kind of talked about but equal and opposite reactions yeah so the ankle is as i say you're you're pushing off the stirrups which then is the first angle or the first joint of movement and, and how it compresses and takes up the weight of the rider now that equally also happens up at the femur as well so you've got the yeah. two ends of the pelvis and the ankle are the two most important areas now i i generally kind of go well the ankle is more important than the 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 femur um because there's the the femur and everything is is really complex and that's when you're when you're talking about femurs your and femur angles you're then also got to talk about pelvis shapes and then you've got to, if you're talking about pelvis shapes you've got to talk about lumbar back the lower back <laughs> structure in terms of lordotic or kyphotic position you then got a little, a little advanced for us. Yeah, yeah, no, no, this is this is what I mean. It, it gets it gets lovely and complex, but it, it because yeah. because everything knocks on to each other. So, for example, just bring it back. You can see on the picture onto the right how the pelvis has dropped on one side. Now, what's going to happen at the ankle is the ankle's going to collapse, and it's going to then become more unstable. So, by correcting the hip you're then going to correct the ankle lower down. Mm. So what you did in that saddle is spot on. When we put both supports in, I really didn't think, think I needed this side. Okay. So this side feels just normal now. It right. Feels natural. So yes. with that, and that then helps me to push my left hip that instant bit because I had more contact. Right. So the support of the saddle underneath yeah. allowed me to do that little. Yeah change okay so padding you helped you to rotate your hip yeah wow that's really good and then we having the padding under the thigh stabilized your foot yeah. your ankle Definitely. okay so <laughs> you've won a piece of padding <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then equally you would also then correct the ankle to correct the hip. So you could do then, but vice versa. So it's not just as simple as sitting in a saddle and giving the rider a comfy saddle, because I find that if you give them comfort, they settle into their own compensations and asymmetry. I've got yes. a couple of questions here. Lots of long riding boots limit ankle flexibility. Maybe yes. we're not so much looking for flexibility. The difficulty is is the optimum position to put the foot into because ultimately you want the foot horizontal. There is an argument to be had because humans, um, especially in Western culture, we are not as flexible as we should be. Okay. So in Western culture, we sit quite a lot, but we sit in a very comfortable chair position, which means that when we sit down in a chair, our head and our hips and our pelvis are in vertical alignment, but our feet and our ankles are pushed forward. Yeah. And we correspondingly then get shortening and tightening into our hip flexors and various things like that. Now, when we do bring our feet into alignment, 
such as when we're riding properly, head, hip and heel are in vertical alignment, you will find a lot of people complain because they cut, they don't have natural flexibility into the hip flexors. Yeah. So, and that's because of Western culture, because we're so used to sitting in normal chairs or theoretically normal chairs that we don't have natural flexibility onto our hips. Now, the problem is, is then if you bring the hip or the bring the ankle into vertical alignment, if they have a shortening into their anterior muscles, which are the quads and the psoas and various things like that, they will then anteriorly rotate the pelvis, which will then make the rider feel like they're leaning forward and make yeah. them feel insecure. Yeah. So you've then got this problem because of, and it's not a problem because of the structure, it is a problem because of the lack of flexibility. So to summarize the situation up to this point, I think we can all agree that a stable rider is a good thing and that achieving this three dimensional stability and balance is very challenging for the rider and even challenging for the more skilled riders because of this tendency to acquire asymmetry the more they ride or certainly the more they ride flat work this is this is not about skill <laughs> this is about posture refer back to the discussion in my group uh, the learn saddle fitting about that new paper that I posted about the rider and the gym ball and the more skilled riders let's call them skilled uh, according to the researchers they could they could not not so much balance on the gym ball, but they were more flexible. They had more mobile pelvises on that gym ball compared with the much lesser skilled riders. So this does relate to uh, the, the discussion points that were just had in that video. In the Western world, we have much less flexible, less mobile hips than, for example, in uh, India. And, you know, it's a real problem because we, we're seated, we slouch our postures, we've got cars and we often, riders don't often work on themselves to be able to ride. If it comes down to hip mobility then that's what riders need to do the same as a golfer for example might need to be very flexible very strong so that they can make that torsional movement for golf you know so i want you to think about this week if you can think of the different sports think of the footballers what are the attributes in each sport that each of those athletes need because actually we don't really or fully know what it is 
that riders need to do in order to ride a horse well and uh, this so i will be looking at this in my phd so uh, rest assured that i'm on the case so we we know that it's down to stability and synchrony but that's for another lecture okay so a couple of comments here to catch up on then i will change the reel i think there's also a big difference in amateur drivers maybe you mean riders and real professionals who have a whole management around them yeah for sure they often do sitting training and fitness yeah that helps amateurs must much less yeah show jumpers only have one saddle yes <laughs> uh, or two one for training one for competition the competition one being the sponsors sponsored saddle and i'm curious if that padding works how do you make that final or is it something temporary mm. i I think if the rider needs it and they feel really comfortable, then it's it's not temporary. It, it's another piece of support that, that can go in that saddle. But it really depends whether, so for example, the rider on the spotty horse with that pad, she was unstable and had left hip pain. And... I needed her to correct her rotation and often let's say for example I need to make the correction on the left and the problem hip is on the right the one with the pain for example then it could help to put that pad on the right so that the rider gets proprioceptive information and is able then to make a correction so often and think about this just make sure it make sure it goes right in that the painful hip is the weak hip so any joint that is painful is also weak if especially if it's chronic pain because obviously uh, we do not want to use joints that are painful therefore the function will then become progressively compromised reduced and therefore the the strength has to be built up again or they will compensate or it'll be weak won't function so okay another comment i was thinking about that that if the padding works how do you make that final or is it something temporary uh no reason why you couldn't ask for a manufacturer to put velcro under the skirt and have different foam pads to attach underneath but not sure about stirrup safety if it would hinder if the leathers need to come off so yeah you've got to be really careful there uh, about suggesting this this stuff but yeah that's a real good point about stirrup safety if it would hinder the leather needs to come off but it's something you would do for people in dressage training so i don't say they should go around a cross-country course with them on at all but in saddles you can see a tiny piece of padding usually maybe that big that might be uh, to the the back of the flap or just some padding that goes at the back under the skirt this is what the manufacturer is attempting to do is to give more support but because it's generic and most saddles just they're for the generic rider i don't find that padding enough to make a difference usually yeah maybe it could go under the sweat flap yep good one good idea but they certainly riders love them when they feel them okay uh let's go on to the next film got it and let's take a brief look at how posture may be formed 
The stance adopted represents its biomechanically organized balance response to forces of gravity. And core strength can be a large part of that. Intrinsic lumbopelvic support is provided by the neuromyofascial system as neuromotor control. So there's more at play here than just the muscles, their tendons, the bones, the levers made. There is an important neurological element to the control of this stability. And this will dictate how the body is held as posture. It will impact on saddle fit. So for example, if we look here, this horse has more rib cage prominent on the left side compared with the right where the vertebrae have rotated towards. So it's easy to see how this would make saddle fitting more of a challenge. It reflects the quality of the balance of muscle development, tone and condition. So all of this is happening because of the forces of gravity and it's our neuromyofascial system that has to counteract this and get the body into position for the tasks that we undertake on a daily basis. How much work those muscles have to do will dictate how those muscles are developed, toned and conditioned. Chronic muscle contractures distort the skeletal framework into a base that is either too wide, too narrow, too short or long. So given that muscles crossing joints and forming levers are participating in work or effort, if they become dysfunctional by not being able to switch off, so contracted rather than contracting and relaxing as normal function, then this can affect not just the area that's affected, but the overall base of support. As a result of restriction or strain, and then preventing adoption of a comfortable neutral stance. And these images here are an example of a rider seated on a saddle stand and just merely being asked to abduct a thigh, one then the other. And we can see that on one side they are stable and can perform this without any problems. But on the other side, there's a weakness there so that they have to lean in order to engage the hip muscles to perform the abduction. And it's possible to see load if you know what you're looking for. And it is, it's the organization of the body against the forces of gravity. We can see power leaks in static posture so that here the power leak would appear to be in the back in this region that seems to be where there's a weakness there and the horse is not supporting it very well in this picture but is very much better in this picture uh, incidentally this was a horse that i treated and this was the before picture and this is the after picture so thinking in terms of the neuromyofascial system and optimizing it and this is the result not very obvious power leaks in this picture compared with this one although i can see a weakness now in the sacroiliac region 
So it's very useful to take a look at these images of the static posture because that will be reflected in the dynamic posture very often, although the body is good at compensating. It, as I've just done, it can point to compromised regions or structures. It's possible to predict how the horse will move, as I've just stated. Facial expressions can reveal discomfort. A therapy session can substantially change the posture, as I've just demonstrated here. But, but this posture, this improved posture, will require exercise therapy for development and maintenance. So it can become an ongoing issue which requires the body to be educated or the neuromyofascial system to be educated to maintain the improvements. So it is very, very useful if you're exercising a horse or treating a horse, very useful to take a before and an after picture because you will see these power leaks. So what about training equine posture? This is a brief overview of that vast subject. Firstly, does the horse have that vertical with a movement without a rider? If it doesn't, then it will be more difficult for the rider to facilitate this. Everything's being transmitted through the back. Just watch the lift of the withers there with each stride, there, there. The training and loading history is meticulously etched in the muscle tone, condition and balance. And what that means is that virtually every movement or activity program that the horse is engaged in or the human that will be reflected in the development of the muscles, how well toned those muscles are or not, and the balance of that musculature. Because for example, if a horse is pulling itself along, there will be more development in the triceps. These will become overdeveloped potentially and often reactive, whereas this hypertonicity may not be seen in the pelvic musculature or the extensors. So if the horse has the imbalance of using the front end more, disproportionately more than using the back end, then there will be differences in tone and the muscle development. And the end result is the integrity of the static and dynamic posture. Is it fit for purpose? Conditioning training is posture training. So depending on the types of activities the horse will be engaged in for the conditioning, that will determine the quality of the posture or the quality of the efficiency, biomechanical, biophysical efficiency of the posture. No restrictions, good crossover there, which is not excessive, full awareness of his body and fully prepared to use his whole body. So a trainer needs to be mindful of exactly which body tissues and structures are being trained when they are directing activities. And resistant horses should not be punished for expressing their discomfort because it may be a postural issue or weakness which they just can't help. So they require careful monitoring and rigorous support to return them to full compliance with the conditioning process. Horses are no different to humans in the sense that 
when we embark on a body conditioning program, if it's uncomfortable, we are less likely to buy into it compared with if the process was made easier and formulated so that we can cope with it without wanting to give up immediately. Can the asymmetrical rider effectively train a horse to ambidexterity? In other words, if we take an asymmetrical rider and take a weak, lesser trained horse that's perhaps one sided, what can the rider do to train the horse to be more balanced in the lateral flexion, for example? And I'll give you a few minutes to think about that. How are they going to go about riding the horse, prescribing exercises so that the horse becomes balanced? What do you think? Because apparently these uh, dressage riders uh, get more and more asymmetrical. So how does the asymmetrical rider train the horse to be symmetrical? Any ideas? Anyone? What do you think they might? How do you think they might approach that? It doesn't. It's counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense that an asymmetrical rider can teach a horse to be symmetrical. Maybe not many of them do. So if you've got any thoughts on that. Aha, we have something here. I would send the rider for body work. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, we need to straighten the rider. So yeah, it just doesn't make sense. But I suggest they find a coach who can see the asymmetries. Uh, yeah, so we have, uh, I don't think they're able. Yeah, you, you, it, would, it would make you think that. Uh, pick a horse which is the opposite. Yes, yes, that's a good one. <laughs> I've actually seen somebody s straighten up in an asymmetrical saddle uh, that way because they had the opposite symmetry to the saddle. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, I, I think possibly how they do it is they possibly carry themselves better. So the better that they support themselves and the less uh, hindrance they are on the horse's back, that might work. But it just, it doesn't seem possible really. Okay, just something to think about. Okay, we'll go on for another couple of minutes if that's okay. Just a few more minutes. Conditioning potential is dictated largely by posture and aspects of muscle balance, symmetry. Core strength is an important element of conditioning potential. If it's not there and it's not being trained, then the conditioning may take a lot longer to achieve and the full potential of the conditioning may never be achieved if the posture, integrity of the posture is neglected. Injury history. An injured body has weaknesses which may never fully rehabilitate. So in other words, the exercise program should take into account the weaknesses and those should be addressed before a whole body conditioning program is undertaken or carried out or implemented. Discomfort, pain and restriction levels will negatively impact on conditioning potential. In the same way that injury will create weaknesses, pain will prevent the individual from full participation 
so as to guard and protect their vulnerable, painful or restricted regions. Scar tissue, that's part of guarding restriction levels or it may limit range of motion and in turn conditioning potential because if we can't fully move it's more difficult to condition although it depends what you're conditioning if you're conditioning for cardiovascular fitness then for example if you've got a problem with the hip joint you can get fit while you're seated so as to isolate the lower body rider posture for a horse will limit conditioning potential so if not the cardiovascular potential it will limit symmetry training so for those resorting to development tack there are for example side reins the Pessoa and this complex piece of kit it can be challenging to set the horse's posture to the desired outcome so do you want them to work low or do you want them to work more collected the system of pulleys and ropes attached from from the mouth and in connection with the horse's hind end movement it's the horse that's going to decide how it responds to that pressure and you may not get the result that you anticipated equi that's a system which attaches from the bit to behind the withers and back round to the other side of the bit so without the hind end involvement but again it relies on being attached in some way to the mouth or the head and the horse has to avoid discomfort to bring about the desired shape because it is only a shape if the horse is not using its body or using its back and using the the thoracic sling system and pushing up then results will be limited draw reins which are fitted from the girth to the mouth and to back to the rider's hands again the restriction will hold the head in a certain position and the horse has to avoid discomfort to make the shape or posture that the rider desires or many of them are used for control so fixing the front end with the threat that if the horse moves out of the desired gait it will be punished it will be restricted so potentially won't even try resistance bands behind quarters they seem to be picking up a lot of popularity at the moment I have seen too many of them working in these which cause the lumbar sacral joint to hyperflex and instead of being used for several minutes or several repetitions they are being used for the entire exercise session so that's similar to attending an exercise class and just doing sit-ups for 45 minutes or so counterproductive 
And again, when you start exercising the horse out of the usual or normal for the horse range of motion, which is usually restricted if the riders are resorting to this tack. So the horse will become fatigued more quickly. The horse may compensate as a result of having to use weak muscles. Figure of eight bandage, which I am a big fan of because they are not restrictive if they are fitted as they were intended. And that is fitted in a figure of eight from the centre of the back around the hind end, back up to the mid back and around the front end, around where the point of shoulders are. So it has to be fitted between the hock and the dock because you need to avoid it getting caught up under the horse's tail and alarming it. And attaching tack or a lunge line directly onto the bit, that is a form of development tack because again, you're attempting to influence the horse's head to influence their dynamic posture. Another piece of development tack, not always development though, is a rider. If their own posture is poor, then that will reflect on the horse's posture. Again, compensations coming in and takes us back to the question of, can an asymmetrical rider train a horse to be symmetrical? No development tack. As a result, with that freedom of movement, it's much easier for the horse to become rotationally neutral through the spine and have the rib cage central. When they have the choice about how they utilize their posture, they can become more stable more quickly. And no development tack would be the equivalent of a non coercive rider that is symmetrical in their own posture. So we have to think about the use of these items, products, and ensure that the training program is not toxic to postural development. Okay, so as you can tell, I'm, I'm not a fan of a development tack at all. So really, I can only say, sorry if I upset one or two of you, but if uh, you're having to resort to development tack, then you, you shouldn't be training a horse at all. <laughs> okay, uh, do you use taping? No, that's, if any product is used in the wrong hands, then it's either not going to be effective or it's going to be harmful. I think they're specialised products. Therefore, they belong with specialised people who've had uh, specialised training. OK, so, uh, yes, uh, a lot of riders just shout out. It's the horse or the saddle that's the problem. Yeah, the riders will not and are not normally encouraged to look to themselves to have their posture individually individually um, assessed and this is why you're here <laughs> uh, horses are always compensating which may cause injuries in the long long run yeah so many horses unfortunately they have a very short lifespan uh, if they're in competition usually so yeah that's that's the issue there so but anyway we're going to change that we'll actually be covering uh, evaluation of the rider tonight but i've got about half an hour uh, more of the theory i'm going to do a bit about conditioning now off we go 
there is a formula for these stages and they would begin with promoting symmetry, then suppleness, and then strengthening, followed by stamina, then inputting the skill, and only then, when you have all these as a firm foundation, then you can work on the speed. And the speed, I don't mean that they would necessarily go faster, but speed could also be technique of whatever discipline the horse is engaged in. And this is applicable for people too. So that when we're working on the rider, we are making recommendations when we've evaluated them about their symmetry and their suppleness and their strength. We don't necessarily work on or comment on these elements. And of course, this all has to be formulated in the conditioning program with frequency of the activity that we've chosen or activities, the intensity of that activity and how long the horse or rider is going to participate in it. It's not just a question of how many poles we're going to put down. Exercise prescription is a specialised subject in order to get the desired result and for the horse or the person to remain safe and injury free throughout the process. So when we carry out a postural assessment and it's followed up with body work to address the issues that we found in our assessment, that would constitute the symmetry element of this process. Assessing the normal range of motion would constitute suppleness. And it makes sense that we address the asymmetry because if we don't, it will impact on achieving normal range of motion. Then when we assess the core strength capability, that's the strength element. When we calculate condition or fat score or the BMI, body mass index, of a rider, we are preparing them for the stamina element so that the closer the body is to the ideal condition, the better able they will be able to develop their stamina. And when we prescribe exercise, that would incorporate some skill. So, for example, if you're training a young show jumper, you wouldn't just keep raising the height of the fences. You might put some poles on the ground and get them to lengthen and shorten and turn and move over the centre of poles and perhaps do a small grid of low bounce fences. So making the exercise sport specific will progress the conditioning a lot faster than just selecting random sort of related activities. Introducing some sport specific exercise and relating it to the job that the horse will ultimately do, that will go a long way towards developing the speed or dexterity or agility element of the conditioning program. And for strengthening, we need resistance loading. So it really isn't until a rider gets on board that the horse is sufficiently neuromuscularly challenged 
to develop their strength. And for this strength development, a controlled progressive measure of resistance is needed. That's why when we start riding young horses, they're usually ridden by the lighter weight riders. And same as the rider going to the gym for general strength training, they wouldn't start with the heaviest weights. They would progress from what they were capable of doing to being more challenged and increasing the weight as they can cope better with the weights that they're working with. And this stimulates the adaptation for the strengthening of the muscles. The muscles will not get stronger unless they are challenged. And the challenge is usually against the force of gravity. And just keep in mind this concept of the asymmetrical rider and potentially how horses can end up asymmetrical or one-sided because the rider may be strengthening them on one side and not the other if their weight is unequal. And this must be done without detriment to body tissue. And it assumes that the horse is sufficiently strong, skilled, balanced and coordinated. And this is why we do ground schooling and working in hand, because it is so important to work the horse's posture to optimise their attempts to carry a rider which unfortunately many of them are asymmetrical. So for that not to impact so greatly on the horse's posture, if we train the horse's posture to be the best it can be first, then they'll be better able to cope with the load of the rider, the asymmetrical rider. So strength training for horses is transitions, hill or slope work in walk, bounce fences, slow trot, for example. This all requires a measure of increased effort and that effort will stimulate the muscles to strengthen. And as I stated before, the moving horse seeks to balance the load from the ground upwards, underneath the saddle and the rider. So for example, if this horse was being ridden by this rider in something like this position predominantly, then you can see how they would develop the muscles they would be receiving the resistance training to build up the muscles on this side against the forces exerted upon it. And a horse's musculature posture will become unbalanced if it's not loaded symmetrically in the main. So we really got to think about the activities that we do with horses in their usual exercise programs, their daily activity programs. And that includes hanging hay nets in a corner of a stable, for example, so that if they have to pick hay out of a hay net and they're always doing it in one direction, that is exercise. And that will cause a shortening of the muscles on the side of the neck that the horse is working the muscle of. And the horse's strategy is to place or organize that load centrally and evenly. That's where they want the rider to be. It's irritating having a rider loading asymmetrically. So they seek to balance the rider centrally like we saw in the film of the horse that had the 
temporarily asymmetrical rider. The horse was quite disturbed and was attempting to shift the rider to the, the normal position that it's ridden in. And the success of this strategy of resistance loading or strength training is dependent on core suppleness, strength and stamina. For the horse, it requires saddle comfort and a high level and consistency of rider stability and skill. So an uncomfortable saddle will cause the horse to potentially hollow or extend their back against the uncomfortable pressure. And they may well do the same with a rider that makes them uncomfortable. But what I typically see is a blocking of this wither movement, a blocking of the back movement. And that has a negative impact on the gait and in turn is likely to increase injury of the vulnerable structures of the lower limbs. And foot contact with the ground plus the time spent in stance is critical to injury risk and performance potential. And there's a very interesting lecture by Professor Renata Weller where she explains that it's not the conformation of a horse that correlates with their performance potential, but how they utilize the stretch recoil mechanisms within the fetlock joints. So I can give you the link to that lecture because it is fascinating. So this would suggest that it's better to work the horse without the rider or without the unskilled rider at least and work on their foot placement, work on their agility, work on their proprioception. That's an important part of the exercise prescription rather than just developing the top line. We need to develop how they dynamically support that top line with their limbs in precision performance work. Any questions about any of that? Because the 20 week group will be exploring that in a lot more detail. But uh, what I want you to get from it is that there are basically five, five stages, suppling, sorry, sym six, <laughs> symmetry, suppling, strengthening, stamina, skill, then what I call speed. It's actually agility. If you were learning ballet, you couldn't do it really fast like those who'd been doing it for several years. You have to start off with the suppling and then you put the frequency, duration and uh, intensity in. So usually with horses, we can be doing a little too much uh, intensity. I don't think that the, the average rider, if there is such a, a person, the average non-competitive rider, uh, perhaps the frequency isn't quite enough, but then we have injury to balance against that. And um, duration, maybe an endurance stamina type uh, activity. So balancing those three against those, those six against those three. So it's, it's not really any more difficult than that, except we have an awful lot of trainers out there who basically apply what they know to these horses without really being able to explain why they're doing what they're doing. So anything, no questions about that. Okay, let's move on to our rider. Need a balanced rider. And balance it's a it's a word that's used a lot, but to me it's comes from the rider being stable. 
And that general stability is dependent on the intrinsic arrangement of the base of support. So how does this walking rider organize their posture and make contact with the ground to remain upright? In equitation, a lot of destabilization of the posture is occurring as the rider attempts to remain on board a moving horse. And that involves being as stable and sitting as still as possible, which will aid the balance strategies. And to do this, riders tend to use their vision so that the elite riders are more reliant on coordinated tactility or feel compared with novice riders. And what that means is that the more practice, the more experience, the more competent that the rider becomes, the less reliant they are on vision for balance. And if we refer to the homunculus model, of motor and sensory structures in the body. We can see that uh, this is sensory and a lot of the brain is involved with touch, sensations in the hands. And for the motor connection area of the brain, motor control of the hands takes up even more brain space. And this is why we often get new riders whose default is to rely on their hands and the reins for their balance and stability. They can't help it. <laughs> because in evolution terms, the rider is not fully physically prepared to balance on a moving object via the pelvis and the thighs and then communicate with the horse. And this is possibly another reason why the hands are so involved with communicating with the horse, because it's quite convenient to do so down through the reins to the horse's bit in preference to developing seat aids. This, this strategy of riding where we are balancing or attempting to balance from the pelvis is unnatural to us. And until we develop that competence and skill, it will result in a lot of physical and psychological insecurity. Stability is learned. And the basis of our stability on a moving horse, in simple terms, is a strategy of a pulley and lever system exerting a force to create and resist forces across three planes, not just three planes of movement, but now think of that of, as being three planes of stability to be stable across three planes in three dimensions. And consider that a vertical rider on a horizontal beam that is the horse this way <laughs> needs horizontal plane stability. They need rotational stability to balance on a horizontal contact surface, which requires functional symmetry. So let's see what we can now do to evaluate for potential weaknesses in the rider's stability with a view to ultimately having that addressed. So the first thing we must do is notate the history and not all riders are comfortable with sharing their 
injury history or their daily activities, routines, etc. So it can be good to use a clipboard because this can create a barrier between you and the rider and help to make it a little more impersonal for them. And you can also look down and write and focus on the clipboard more than having a hard focus on the rider's body. <laughs> so that can help to make the experience more comfortable for the rider. And you must risk assess before you perform your tests and that's been covered. Make sure you're fully conversant with how to carry out a risk assessment. You must keep your rider, the horse, yourself as safe as possible whenever you are around them. If not, if it's not possible to be safe, then you cannot carry out the tests. And it's important to explain the tests so that the rider is comfortable with giving their consent for them. So very often what I'll do is, for example, in a, a leg squat, I will do that test myself so that the rider knows what's expected of them, what they're going to be asked to do, and they can then decide whether or not they're happy doing that. Because they don't know what postural testing involves. And most of us are self-conscious and having somebody look at your body in close proximity is disconcerting. We can use weight scales and look at the loading. So this example, there's 34.8 kilos on one scale and 35.9 on the other. This means that this rider's got very good balance to around a kilo being loaded down each limb. But, but if you suddenly produce some scales, it can make many riders panic. So it's important to explain that this is not a mandatory part of the process. And they should only do this if they're comfortable in doing it. So again, nip on the scales yourself. And if you're not prepared to do that yourself, don't expect the rider to do it. But we can get a lot of information from how the rider loads or their loading preferences of their body, but they're not essential because we can collect similar information as we progress through the tests that are just as meaningful. We can have the rider walk away and walk back. So ask them to walk away for, say, 10 steps and back again. And that will give us some information about their balance and coordination from side to side. So, for example, this rider tends to be weak on this left side so that they are leaning as they move away. And we will see this rider walking in a film later. Also, you can look at the base of support. You can look at how they use their joints, how much stability is there in their waist, for example, the coupling between the rib cage and the pelvis. So just the simple act of asking them to walk away and walk back in a jacket or T-shirt, which is marked with these lines, very, very useful very obvious to see those postural weaknesses with this. And we will look at the static alignment so that when they have come back to halt and they're standing in front of you, then you would look at their posture from behind. So again, we can see that this rider is also leaning to the left and there's a problem with the base. Here. 
And it's important to be able to determine how their rib cage is centered or not over their pelvis. So you can see this one, this is good centering here. This is not good centering because there is some tilt there. So we look from the side, we look from behind. You can look from the front, but you'll, you'll get as much information from behind. And also you would look for the gap made at the waist between the elbow and the weight and the rib cage and see if one side there's more daylight showing through there compared with the other. This would indicate some rotation in the upper body. Again, is the rib cage central very important? And we can ask them to walk backwards for proprioception, see how they cope with that. How brave are they? moving around backwards without the vision in their environment and on the ground surface. It really does vary between riders. And we can place them against a wall and look at their rotations. This is a very useful way of assessing the rider because when you place them against a wall the rotations will be fairly obvious but the wall has to be fairly flat and preferably without a board at the bottom although at this stage we are looking more for upper body rotations so shoulder ribs and pelvis when these rotations are addressed, there can be some very powerful results in terms of the rider being able to influence the horse's push up. And that's when all this starts to get very exciting indeed. Yeah, she's doing it. So she's going up, up, up. OK, just change back to your old settings. If you just take your hands away from the withers a little bit so you could see, that's it. And just go back to the old way. Oh, yeah, you can. <laughs> she goes flat. Yeah, yeah, I really felt that. It's almost like the horse just gave up. Yes. If you know what I mean. Oh, like, no. they do. They absolutely do. That yes. Was huge. Yeah. Let's lose it again. You can almost see her going, oh. You can feel her just go, no. Okay. And let's get the factory settings back again. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, you can see she just creeps up like a she cat. She just gets lighter. Yes. And what did I do with that rider that changed how her horse went? I did tell you. <laughs> Oh, we've got it. We've got an answer. Core strength, pelvis. Oh, yes, that was one of them. Yeah. What did I do? Pelvis was one. Core strength is connected. Yes. I got her to lift and lower her hands. Uh, oh, I, I did do that, but it wasn't part of. I just wanted her to get her hands away from the withers. Ah, rib cage alignment. Yes. What else? I just told you what I was going to do. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, we got somebody in the five week group. Shoulder, ribs, and pelvis. Yay! Go to the top of the class. Well done. So, all I did was exactly what I was doing. In the slide, I just explained to you where I would put them against a wall and assess for the rotations. You can see the shoulder, the uh, rib cage or the waist and the pelvis. And which plane, if I was altering them or correcting them, 
which plane was I working in that was I correcting? Which movement plane? Was it the frontal? Was it the uh, horizontal? Or was it the sagittal plane? So if sagittal plane is from the side, which is your usual shoulder hip heel that you get squawked at for, for not having your yourself in line. If the frontal plane is looking at the rider from the front or the back. What's the other plane? Okay, it's horizontal. Oh, hang on. I've got some an answer here. Ah, uh, yeah, horizontal, yes. Yeah got it uh, it looks sagittal because I've put the arrows on the rider in the sagittal plane just to confuse you but just get if you get anything from this course get that it's the horizontal plane the rotations remember I just said if you want to sit on a horizontal surface you're going to have to be aligned horizontally which means the the rotational plane so just bear that in mind don't don't overthink it for now horizontal says yes stay at the top of the class <laughs> so that's the magic of these techniques riders will never unless they've been to me first they will never have been told to adjust their shoulder backwards they will never have been told to plant the rib cage or to alter the position slightly of the rib cage they will never never have been told to just put when i say put the pelvis in neutral position that's from front to back but in neutral rotation it's which one is protracted which one is clockwise anti-clockwise as in a circle when you've got the rider against the wall then you might ask them to put their thumbs on their the bony part of the pelvis and again i do this myself to show them and also to demonstrate that you know i'm comfortable with doing it and this is how you do it and uh, we can do it very simply very quickly and this will show you if they've got their thumbs exactly in the right place on each side of those bones you will then clearly see a rotation there and again, it's about the shoulder, the rib cage, and the hip rotations. Very, very important, very, and very overlooked by trainers, coaches, researchers. And then we would ask them to do a single leg squat and look at the balance and we're interested in the stability of the hip joint the knee joint and the ankle joint so as they squat they can get quite wobbly and it can be possible to see which is the weakest joint it's not always possible and not always obvious but nevertheless we can test whether they're stronger or more stable on one side compared with the other i've told you about the upper body there is some kind of spookery going on when we put some emphasis on the ankle and you will see with a lot of these riders they've got some ankle problems i think nearly everyone's sprained their ankle at some point in their life the ankle is the first joint that stacks up the rest of the body higher up so you might think oh but the ride is sitting down it doesn't matter but you know the, the things that i did with my magic piece of sponge rolling it up putting it under the rider's thigh giving them some proprioception on the hip joint that was when the job started to get really interesting because we were going to ask them to perform this test on the other side so you do normally get very different results from side to side and this is about the actual joint stability and you might say well we don't use these joints 
when we're riding. It's all about the pelvis and the upper body. But when we move on to the ridden phase of actually stabilizing the rider, you will find out how important it is for the hip and the ankle to be stable. And we'll take a seat bone, pubic bone imprint. And uh, we've seen the imprint earlier, so that's part of the tests. And do remember that as you ask the rider to participate in all these tests, their wonderful muscle memory will have them chatting in depth quite often about their falls, their injuries, their physio, that it'll all come flooding back to them. So don't spend too much time in the beginning interrogating them because in my experience it will all come flooding out later. Walking backwards tests their general proprioception. As I said, how do they organize their posture when they don't have their vision to work with directly? Are they confident? Do they walk back with purpose or are they tentative? Do they walk back in a straight line or do they drift left or right in much the way we see the horses do when they're when we're trotting them up, uh, but not backwards. Do they maintain good posture throughout or are they collapsing at the waist and shoulders? So let's have a look at a video now and put all that together. So when you're observing this rider, she does only walk away and back once, but take a look particularly in the waist or low back region and you'll see some asymmetrical movement there and also what also concerned me about this rider was how she seemed very earthbound in her walking and there's a good reason for that which will become apparent carry on yeah just walk away and walk back i'm more interested in how you land coming back And stop there great okay so what can we see first of all uh, first of all apologies if if I say anything a bit rude <laughs> uh, we're just purely putting magnifying glasses on you it helps me so yeah that's fine. okay right so the first thing we can see is that she tends to land quite pigeon toed yeah okay and the next thing i won't put your face in this so let's go to the shoulders so pretty good shoulders nice, yeah. yeah but the right one you can see it's a bit more uh, protracted yes yeah. gaps in the arm i've got one on the her left yeah can you see that oh yeah, oh, yeah. but she looks very secure shoulder and ribs but if you look uh, towards her pelvis oh, yeah. She tends to be over the knee. You see her loading is more to her toes yeah. than... <laughs> yeah, this would be interesting for us against a wall uh, to see her there. So let's have a look at the back. The top half is impressive. And you say it should be for a young person. Uh, but I'm, I'm a little concerned. If you actually look at her left foot, foot yes. that is... Okay, so I'm very interested as to what's happened perhaps to her uh, in, in a past life. <laughs> Any uh, she is actually standing on a strip between concrete there, but I don't think it affected her much. I don't, don't think it exaggerated her left foot position so just ignore i didn't want her to walk on and i didn't want to alert her i just took her as she landed and she decided to stand on the uh divider so let's keep going injuries sprained ankle, sprained ankle. okay so how long ago was that um five years ago 
five years. Okay, are you, are you aware that it's maybe it's causing some asymmetry? Probably not. <laughs> Can I ask how old you are? I'm 17. She's 17. Uh, and, and she's... <laughs> I've got hypermobile ligaments and joints. She's hypermobile, well. so that possibly is a reason that, that she's not completely symmetrical. But I would definitely refer her to get this fixed because the 17 year old, the 17 year olds today are expected to live to 100. But I'm concerned because uh, you, you have to be symmetrical to, yeah. to, to get there. You're a horse rider, so that's an issue. Upper body, great, but that's an issue, and I think that's affecting how you perhaps mm -hmm. push off or you're weak in your left side definitely asymmetry through the stirrups yeah you probably ride better without them <laughs> not that you probably tried um right okay i just want you to note there that i did get her consent uh, because i said to her in the beginning is it okay if i'm a bit rude <laughs> so i prepared her for that because you can't take a uh, a minor or anyone really but especially a minor a 17 year old girl and start ripping into them about their body so you must find something good about their posture first you cannot just give uh, bad news all the way and then basically tell them that you're wondering why they're not in a wheelchair so don't do that you, you must balance your argument play down the asymmetry and if the parent is or call it asymmetry rather than your technical terms but if the parent is there then you would have more of a discussion with the parent than the minor but i've got some comments here in bowen therapy it's the ankle the beginning of a lot of problems yes you could see from that rider and another comment i spent half a day with a chiropodist human and he said half the foot pain he gets is because they're loading wrong on their feet you're going to see very few people now with uh, matching ankles two clients this week didn't have any strength in one leg from the hip and didn't realize yep and i broke the head off my fibula uh, after that i have asymmetry problems yeah and ankle problems on that side or also my hip is twisted yeah possibly because of the ankle and another comment agreed the ankle is not ever thought about for riders but so important i had a coach who started at the ankle and worked up i was thankful to have her so yeah this business about heels down it's for some people it's just not going to work because they're going to look different on one side compared with the other if they've got one ankle problem so let's go on if there's no questions and here's an, another example of a rider and the top is a bit baggy but again she has some asymmetry in the lumbar region which you can see in the front but otherwise reasonable good foot alignment and looking from the side a little bit too much of a curve there in the lumbar which is quite common in uh, more common in female riders and you can see how this technique is very good for locating the rotated pelvis and she flexes at the waist to compensate so she's moving her head down more than she's actually flex flexing her hip knee and ankle joints so a compensation there and quite unstable as she has to use a leg to balance this is better and they don't get much better than this although there is some yeah there is some instability there possibly knee joint and here's our young rider and you can see she just lacks general core strength so she's a little 
less stable than the adult riders and you can see this asymmetry in the alignment but she fits very well into her pelvis uh, here we can see some leaning and yeah there's asymmetry there I can see something already left hip Is that you halting? Oh, you, you're a little bit interesting. So you stand a little bit over. So your ribs stand over your pelvis. Mm -hmm. I wasn't expecting that. And you're almost leaning back with the lower leg. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. Okay. So it's quite leg. interesting. So you can see yeah. she's planting here into the pelvis because that's the most important thing for yeah. me. And then suddenly something gets lost here. Yeah. good and the other side yeah this is so predictable just do it once more yeah and the other side okay yeah The left thigh is protracted and we can see the degree of rotation when we put the rider on the saddle stand and assess the position of the thighs a, a little tip if you have not been able to ascertain which side of the pelvis is more protracted compared with the other either put them on the saddle stand or put them on their saddle if they're riding and you've forgotten what side it is. And if they look down and see which thigh is more protracted than the other, then chances are the pelvis will be protracted on that side. So that's, that's a good way to check your result there. So that can confirm the result. Even something simple as asking the rider to perform a one leg squat, it can be quite a challenge for the joints. So a lot of information to be had there. And even in the, the good, skilled, competent riders who appear to ride well, it's not until you start evaluating their posture that you find out what those nuances are impacting on in the equitation posture and quite often those are the factors which are limiting their performance and even if it's just by a little bit it's still meaningful so feet against the wall this rider is interesting and I just want to take you through the process of standing the rider against the wall and seeing what kind of information we get from that. So feet against the wall, calves against the wall, shoulders against the wall. How comfortable is that for you? Very uncomfortable. Why is it very uncomfortable? Where are you feeling the stretch or the pull? Through my back. Through your back. It makes me feel really rounded through here okay oh so you feel like you're getting really it's difficult for you to flatten your back against the wall yeah, so if these bits are flat i feel like this bit of me shouldn't be against the wall okay and so but you naturally stand to a little bit shoulders back so what if you put your pelvis just as a an exercise what if you tilted your pelvis so belly button behind that's it belly button behind pubic bone what happens now better that's better can you get it any better than that is that about it yeah. okay right and then just do the normal <laughs> okay that's fine uh, so I'm gonna have a look and see if your shoulders are rotated uh, yeah it's the right shoulder which is 
slightly rotated. And the rib cage, if you put your hands down, pretty good equal gap there. But I can see instantly that your right hip is offset. So your right hip's, you haven't got anything in your pocket, have you? No. no. Your right hip is slightly offset to the way you're, or it looks like you're leaning to your left. Okay, it's all right, we can fix that. Uh, can you put both uh, a thumb on each of the bones of your pelvis? So try to get them in the right position. If you get it on top of the jacket and then I'll be able to see your thumbs, that's it. Okay. And I think I can see that your right pelvis is forward slightly, but only from what I can see of your pelvis. Another way to see this. I'm going to say they're equal. Okay, great. And your feet. So if you just stand forward a bit, I just want to see if those rotations change. And put your hands on your hip. On the subject of strength, <laughs> core strength, let's take a closer look at this aspect of stabilizing the rider. Just one quick question there that came in, a comment. Uh, the width of the horse and twist of the saddle also often amplifies the rotation. Mm. I have many cob type horses. Uh, many riders sit in a scissor seat. Yes, indeed, they do. They do. And how we can test for it. Core strength controls the ability to produce force and motion in locomotion or sports movement. And it's a system of spinal synergistic co-contraction to prevent motion rather than initiate it. And it differs from limb muscle function in that there is stabilization occurring rather than reciprocal flexion and extension. Uh, let me just stop there for a moment. So uh, just in case you missed that or it confused you slightly, the pelvis is very different as a structure so it has uh, the lumbar sacral joint as well as all the, the joints in the lumbar spine and all the way up. And it also has the hip joints. So you've got several joints in close proximity there. Our limbs flex and extend. But the pelvis, its job is to help to stabilize the body. Okay. So just think there's two different functions I've mentioned there. Arms and legs, flex, extend, flex, flex, extend, flex, extend. For movement, basically we're hunter-gatherers. That's all the arms and legs need to do as well as um, prepare the food when we've uh, found it or caught it. <laughs> but the pelvis very much is involved in stabilization. Why? Because the upper body, the higher up you get, the more leverage there is on the body and the more instability. So the job of this and all the muscles attached to it are to stabilize. Mm. And to build core strength, that requires differing conditioning exercises compared with the limbs. So for now, understand that core strength means stability and locomotion with the limbs is a very different reciprocal movement pattern of flexion extension. And this means isometric or still, neither flexing nor extending, but still toned versus 
concentric eccentric exercises meaning as for the limbs that flex and extend and are moving core strength can be activated involuntarily and before peripheral muscle engagement and what that means is that in order for our rider to perform the single leg squat they have to stabilize the body before they use their limbs otherwise she'd just fall over and an example of this is the neutral pelvis position where the alignment of the anterior superior iliac spines and the pubic bone are in the vertical in the sagittal plane so that just means when looking from the side and to get this position it doesn't come naturally all you have to do is rock your pelvis when you're seated rock your pelvis gently backwards and forwards with your hands on your waist or your abdominal muscles and as you find that neutral pelvis position the abdominal musculature will just suddenly contract it will suddenly feel like it's snapped into activating the abdominal muscles the core muscles now I know you're dying to try that, aren't you? <laughs> okay, so as you sit uh, in your chair, let's just see if you can get it because it's the transverse abdominal muscles. I'll just show you that. A lot of emphasis is put on rectus abdominis when you're building core strength. No, for riders, it's transverse abdominis. Think about those rotations as well. And the transverse abdominis is very much more here rather than here. Think here. So as you're sitting, you just, just rock your pelvis just backwards and forwards on your seat bones. So keep your upper body fairly straight keep your back straight rather for now have your shoulders over your pelvis and i have got a film for this so you can play around with that later if you can't find it but put your hands on your transverse abdominus so around your waist and just without consciously contracting your abdominal muscles so what you have to do is try not to influence try and see what happens when you roll the pelvis but roll your pelvis without using your abdominal muscles to roll them okay so just have a go and then you'll find that if you relax your tummy so let your tummy all hang out <laughs> and just roll or tilt your pelvis backwards like you're rounding your back and just feel what happens you cannot stop that muscle contraction so by popular demand I've been asked to demonstrate how to find the neutral pelvis put your hands on your external obliques so just feel just under your rib cage maybe onto your abs but i think you feel it more in the rib cage so you just roll your pelvis and then roll it but do not use your abs to do that so use the glutes so that you're purposely not consciously engaging your abs and just as you roll forward you'll feel it just engage and then when you stay there and feel again you'll feel your muscles contracted now if if you bend to do this or rotate like i am now sideways you will not it won't happen so if you are square over your pelvis and your ribs are down into your pelvis so that you feel very straight and centered forward then try it 
you'll get a much stronger response. So my pelvis is very, my low back is very straight, so I'm almost in neutral anyway. But if I try and curve it first, then roll, there is the point where I can feel it engaging. So I'll just show you where I was feeling. It's here. If you want to try it standing up, you can. The other great way to try is on the floor, side lying. So, and then just let your glutes move your pelvis and that's where you'll find it. So keep your back straight and whatever you do, you just can't seem to stop your abs, your external obliques from just engaging when you get the pelvis in the neutral position. What that means is that your rider, if, if they can make good use, if they can make good use of their pelvis in uh, this plane, backwards and forwards, then they can recruit their abdominal muscles without without much conscious input without much effort is what i mean so that's a very important part of the the upright human but for most of us are sitting down we spend our lives sitting down but so keep that in mind because we can we can utilize that a neutral pelvis really feeling the reflexive abdominal contractions engagement good and and then when you're ready oh, lovely so that keeps your upper back upper back lower back all your back secure And think about infants learning to recruit muscles for standing and walking. There is an innate capability for that. And they have to learn the precision of balance as they progress from lying to sitting to crawling to standing up to walking along, holding on to the furniture and then taking a few steps unaided. It's a lot more complex a system than we take for granted. It's crucial for balance, as I just explained with the baby learning to walk. It organises the body. So think of the rider doing the one leg squat, organising their posture, organising their load so that when they stand on one leg, they don't fall over. It's evolved to be energy saving and efficient and it will create a set of stabilizing muscles for other muscles to function through their full range of motion. Think about the rider that has to perform the one leg squat. It takes some organizing. And abdominal core strength can compensate for strength deficits in the human hip joint. And this means that by recruiting the abdominal muscles, that can boost the power of the hip joint, which they discovered when performing a series of strength tests on strongman competitors. And when it's sufficiently conditioned, it should mean a reduction in injury or strain to associated joints. And as I said earlier, development, tone, condition or functional imbalance in the core strength, in the posture of the rider and the horses is common. 
The muscular can be too weak or too strong, too short or too long. And it doesn't necessarily mean that because we're exercising, because we're conditioning, because we're fitting, that we are developing the posture optimally and with a lot of sports movement it is one-sided but for the horse rider that's not the case for them it's the yard duties that can make them asymmetrical and the falls that they have from the horse and Core strength training requires specialised exercises, not just targeting. So the ubiquitous sit-up will not necessarily improve the working core strength that you will need for tasks other than performing a sit-up. And an example of core muscle imbalance is the longissimus which overlies the multifidus muscle and particularly if there is a past injury to the back or strain in the longissimus muscle multifidus will take over and potentially instead of doing the vertebral stabilizing it will take on more of the job of supporting the entire spine when that's the job of longissimus and when that happens it can result in overuse strain or acute fatigue in that working muscle which was not designed to be anything other than a stabilizing muscle so why does the rider need increased core strength or optimal core strength? For stability on a mobile structure. When we've been riding for more than a few years, we take for granted that it appears relatively easy to balance on a horse, but the moving structure is a challenge to remain seated and in balance on. Balance on a mobile structure. Counteraction of dynamic forces. So for example, think of cantering when there is more movement in the horse because it's an asymmetrical gait. And in order to remain in the saddle, we have to somehow intrinsically counteract the forces of gravity, counteract the movement, or we just fall off. To delay the onset of acute fatigue. So the greater the core strength, the more the rider can sit still and in balance, and the longer it takes them to become fatigued. For delivery of consistent equitation aids, that hardly needs any explanation. When the rider is not sufficiently organized in the saddle, they will not be able to convey their aids to the horse very clearly. To protect and maintain spinal integrity or function, namely the intervertebral discs so that movement in the horse will destabilize the rider and if they cannot support their own spine intrinsically they will be thrown about and potentially injure the discs for optimal interaction with the horse to transmit relaxation to them rather than tension the last thing the horse needs is a wiggly rider because think of them attempting to balance their bodies from the ground upwards with this load imposed on them downwards. And the rider with highly developed core strength can help train the horse towards high core strength also. Although you could argue that a wiggly rider or one that doesn't sit very well, one that's not very stable, would result in the horse 
having to exert more force to balance them. But the result of the rider with high core strength means they can sit still, means that they can perform the exercises to train the horse, such as this one, to train the higher core strength. It means the exercises can be performed with precision. And why does the horse need high core strength? Again, because of the stability that's required underneath a mobile structure. This rider, although we equate good riding with stability and stillness, they have this one meter lever waving uh, in midair. So to some extent, the rider is mobile. And particularly if for jumping or cantering, where the rider has to take a two point seat and balance themselves away from the contact of the saddle seat. Balance under a mobile structure. To counteract the dynamic forces of gravity on its body. For them to delay the onset of acute fatigue. So with greater postural support, to stabilize their moving limbs, it helps them to move straighter. And with less deviation in the locomotion, that is more efficient. Therefore, the time taken to fatigue will be longer. For optimal execution of rider directives, help them to pay attention, interpret the rider signals more easily. To protect and maintain spinal integrity, function, biomechanics of movement, same as for the rider, they need to protect their spine in order to move optimally, in order to condition optimally, especially when there is a rider load parked on it. And a horse trained to develop high core strength helps the rider to sit well. And that's our ultimate goal in equitation is a balanced horse and rider. So for now, get that it's most important to condition the horse and the rider for optimal or increased enhanced core strength for the job that they're doing it's much easier to move that way. Uh, just before I go into that, the paper that I posted in the both of those forums, remember? I like that brand new paper because it says, I'm sure you could challenge it, but it makes perfect sense to me. The more pelvic mobility, which I tend to think is, feels like hip joint mobility to me because I'm old and stiff and, and I can feel that sort of stuff. But the skilled rider equates with having or correlates with having a mobile pelvis. And that's because they can move with the horse that's because, plausibly, they can recruit their core strength, their abdominal muscles, their transverse abdominal muscles. So that that suppleness of the hip joints and suppleness of the lumbar sacral joint helps the rider move with the horse, not just backwards and forwards, because that's just what we see, um, one plane, one sagittal plane, but it helps in all three dimensions. So rotationally and from side to side and backwards and forwards. Okay, so a rolling motion is what happens and if you, if the rider is stiff they will not roll they will not roll so the best thing for this and 
it's another test that I've decided to add. Uh, I can't find my wooden balance board. It's gone off somewhere. Uh, but I will post uh, a picture of it. It's just a wooden circle with a dome underneath it. And you can test your rider. I mean, I don't say to stand on these. This is what they're meant for, really. But uh, sit them on it. And you can just see how mobile they are. Obviously, if they've got back pain or hip pain, then no, or proceed with great caution. And you can just get them to mobilize on this. So you can sit them on a chair uh, or uh, might work with a hay bale, something like that, straw bale, and just see how they rotate, how they work this with their hips and I think that I, I like the wooden boards this this one is old uh, so you can buy them second hand on um, eBay but I do like the plain circular wooden board with a little dome underneath it and uh, in English money they're between 15 and 20 pounds so they're incredibly cheap but Given that the skilled riders have a more mobile pelvis, i.e. they'll be able to work that uh, balance board uh, without a problem. Given that the skilled rider has a mobile pelvis, then for those riders you've got that are really aspiring to be a good rider, you could just say, well, hey, Come and get one of these, 15 pounds, 20 pounds. And uh, <laughs> that's about a third of the cost of your riding instructor. And you could make an awful lot of progress <laughs> with the board uh, compared with what you might make with uh, that uh, designer instructor. So there you are and there you have it. Let's go on. Any questions? Oh, do you let them have their feet on the ground when they sit on it? Yes. Yes, I think so. Because it's the pelvis you're isolating. And uh, yeah, I would give them some support because they need to control that movement so yes you must let them put their feet on the ground because if they injure themselves it will be all your fault <laughs> so do protect them as far as possible when we know that the skilled rider has got a mobile pelvis let, let's let's work from the mobile pelvis not just squawking at them to sit properly because they can't they cannot synchronize with the horse unless their pelvis is mobile so let's help them get mobile not that i'm training you to be their instructors or coaches unless you're qualified of course but i would say to test it will give you a lot of information OK, let's go. And for this, I'm just selling you the advantages of a saddle stand. There's not much of this you can do without a st saddle stand. Although if you really don't have one and you really want to do a really quick evaluation, then I like to stand them against a wall. It's those rotations I'm after because I'm aiming to beat it out of them. Uh, could they use a large gym ball? They used a gym ball in that paper. I like the rigidity of the, the balance circle board. I think if you use a gym ball, I'm not sure how easy it would be for you to really detect how stiff and tight the hips are. But give it a go. If you've got one, give it a go. But I think you'll see more if you use that wooden rigid board and ask them to move very slowly so that they touch it to the chair because I think that gives you more information than a gym ball because a horse is not a gym ball. A saddle is a bit more rigid so let's use a more rigid tool. Okay suggest you invest in a saddle stand for performing the evaluations 
And here are the advantages. The horse can be eliminated as an influence. Very difficult to figure out whether the rider is reacting to the horse's influence or whether it's the rider who is more unstable. So by using a saddle stand, we completely take the horse as the problem out of the equation. And we can walk all around and even stand on something and look down if we want to. We can get more access, better access to their shoulders and just generally view them from 360 degrees. And we can test them more safely and the tests will be more reliable. Again, they haven't got the horse underneath them to shift and influence our tests. The seat bone loading pattern can be accurately obtained. The rider's position can be consistently maintained for evaluation. In other words, there is no shifting of a horse underneath. When this rider is asked to sit still, that's exactly what they do. And the rider's proprioception, their awareness of their position can be consistently maintained for evaluation. So we haven't got an impatient horse underneath. We can get up close to this rider and make some subtle adjustments in many more places than we can do when the rider is sat on a horse. And we don't want to get results which are incorrect. And we can change the rider's position without disturbing the horse. So we can get them doing all sorts of things on a saddle stand that perhaps they wouldn't be able to do on a horse. Because the horse might become alarmed or again, they may shift around as the rider shifts during our tests. And we want to be able to see, we we don't want to see a moving horse and how the rider reacts to a moving horse. We want the rider to demonstrate to us their core strength and only their core strength. We want to see the rider placed on a stable static surface and then see how they react to being destabilized. We'll get much more clear results because this box will not be absorbing movement in the same way that a horse could. So how do we evaluate core strength? Luckily, very simply, the rider must be seated with their feet not touching the ground. So be sure to choose somewhere safe to do this. The tester adopts a secure base of support. They place their fingertips on the rider's anterior shoulders, although it's possible that we can stand behind the rider and still access the anterior shoulders. And the rider resists gentle, progressive pushing forwards. So the tester just gradually applies more and more pressure to the rider's shoulders while the rider attempts to remain in a vertical position. And the added bonus of this is that the rider can then, for the first time ever, <laughs> often experience the isometric contraction of their anterior core. And this is a good exercise because they can get a partner to repeat this while they feel their core muscles working and attempt to hold them in place for progressively longer and longer. It's a very good exercise. And it will indicate to them the degree of engagement and strength of those abdominal muscles. And as I've said, it will teach the rider to consciously engage their anterior core muscles. So then you move your fingers to the superior borders of the scapula, in other words, at the just at the top of their shoulders. Again, you can do this by standing behind the rider. And the rider must 
resist a progressive pull forwards in this position. It will be a push forwards if you were behind them and remain vertical. And this will indicate the degree of engagement and strength through the apaxial musculature. So they'll be feeling their paraspinal muscles engaged and recruited and working to help them remain vertical. And it will indicate to the rider how to consciously engage their back muscles. For using the core when we're riding, we have to be able to engage both the front and the back at the same time to stabilize the spine fully. And the tester notes any difference in symmetry of strength between the abdominal at the front and the apaxial muscles. Most of them will be stronger in the back than they are in the anterior abdomen. And I think a lot of that is because they just don't know how to consciously engage them. Then you repeat the same thing from each side of the rider. So that will give you an all round assessment of their core, front, back, side, side. Four readings. And this test is testing the strength and symmetry of the oblique abdominal muscles, those muscles at the side of the trunk. And indicates to the rider how to consciously engage those two. It's not just about the abs and the apaxial muscles. The rider needs to know how to be stable throughout their abdomen. And then we can test what happens when they then destabilize their own posture dynamically. So the other test was passive because we performed it. Now we're going to ask them to dynamically destabilize themselves. So with an arm extended to the side, they wave moderately vigorously up and down within about a 20 centimeter range. So they have to put a bit of effort into this. This will destabilize their postural spinal alignment. You can see this rider is just mildly tilted to the right in order to extend the arm and wave it. And you repeat the test for the other arm and see what happens to this vertical and horizontal lines. And if you want to destabilize them further, you ask them to circle the arm again, 20 centimeters, one direction and then the other. That works very well as a destabilizing test for the thorax. And then repeat with the arms extended anteriorly. So again, you can see here, you will get some asymmetry of arm action and you can see them tipping either one way or the other. And this could well correspond with this test. So it's just something else you can do. And I'll show you these tests in a film. Abduct the hip joint while aiming to maintain seat bone contact. And it's performed on one side, then the other. And interesting to note, uh, in the same way as the one leg squats, which side does the rider prefer to use first? That can often be the dominant leg or the most comfortable leg to use. And that will be a subconscious decision. So don't coach them on which leg to try first. Just get information as to their preference because that could be important. And you can see this is performed very well for the left leg. And there has to be a compensation put in place to try that for the right hip. 
And then repeat the tests with the rider seated in their usual saddle. That can tell you how much stability they're deriving from the saddle. It's very important to get rider feedback throughout these tests. They are usually unaware that their static and dynamic posture is asymmetrical. And as I highlighted earlier in the presentation, potentially the more we ride, the more we ride flat work dressage, the more asymmetrical we can become. And when their posture is corrected, their altered joint positions will feel wrong to them. They will have no motivation to remain wrong in the saddle because they will have spent years aiming to be right. So the feedback they will get from their muscles is that this is wrong. And this is where good coaching will come into play as the rider can be supported through the process of adjusting their posture and helping their horse as a result, rather than just remaining in that comfortable asymmetrical position. So it can help to have mirrors for this, one in front of the rider and one beside, but uh, that can be something to have in the longer term if you're working with riders in a building where you have a dedicated area to perform these tests. Well worth setting up. As I just said, they are not motivated to adopt a position that feels wrong to them. They're quite happy to live in this position because it feels comfortable. This is not comfortable frequently. And then you would refer the rider to the relevant specialist for postural checks and improvement. But the advantage you have as the tester, even though you may not be treating them, is that you can monitor them over time by performing these tests at intervals. When the ridden posture is corrected, it must be checked regularly or the rider could overcompensate to a new asymmetry. And that's exactly what happened to this rider. So they need to be checked just to make sure that they haven't done what you've asked them to do so well that it sets up another compensation. And this is often the case I find when they correct the rotation in their shoulder, they will put more muscle contraction into one than the other in order to hold that. And they'll have done it so much and trained the shoulder so much to be correct that the other one will then be a problem. So you have to recheck their posture. Don't just let them go off out into the blue yonder to live happily ever after with their rotational corrections. You must explain to them that they have to be checked or it could create another postural anomaly. Even if they, they get a partner to place them against a wall every couple of weeks and get someone else to check it for them quite simply. But don't let them just continue with the corrections and the muscle contractions required to make those corrections because they can't be relied upon for their own feedback. So I'll now show you rider core strength evaluation in this video. And uh, here you can see that it is very useful when you've evaluated them to place stickers on them so that you can remember what you've asked them to correct. So here we have left rib cage or left gap in the arm being greater than the right and the left hip rotation, which is rotated in a clockwise direction or if I say protracted, it just means that it's more forward and it's easy for you to work that out. So again, we retest them on the saddle stand. Where is the rotation in the hips on One the saddle arm stand? One side <laughs> and wave it up and down. 
up and down. A bit more, faster. Yeah. What's happening now? I'm walking them Don't, I, I actually, yeah, take your feet off the ground. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Now the other one. Sorry, put that down to the other one. Oh, we're unstable, aren't we? Okay, do the other one. Change to the other one. So she's much more stable on her left side. Okay. Now, take one arm up and circle it. Uh, I'll show you what to do. Circle fast. Now do the other one. She's really unstable that way, isn't she? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Circle the other way now. I'll just point out I've been very mean oh. to this rider <laughs> because all I had at the time oh. in this demonstration was uh, circling backwards. a barrel. So uh, she was quite unstable. So she side. really did get it's some stable, challenging tests forward. there. And the drumming, more drumming. You can see an instability in the waist here. And the younger rider, she you can see how weak she is. She has to rotate her shoulders to do that. I'm going to push you backwards, but I want you to resist me pushing you backwards. So as I push forwards, you need to push forwards into me. So you're going to immediately feel that your core is going to lace up. So I'm just going to do it very progressively. So resist. What's happening in your tum? Uh, my core is tightening. Okay, so keep it. That's it. Okay. Get your arms down. I'm going to do it a bit more now. I'm just going to see what the limit is. So push, push, push more, push more, push more. Yeah, you're actually quite strong. So hold that. But what I'm seeing here, as she's pushing, if you just want to stand out the way slightly, what's happening behind? Slightly forward. So push again. Anything happening to the posture behind? She's becoming more on level. And when you, as soon as you started, the legs came up and the knees gripped in. Yes. yes. Now, if I look down, <laughs> I mean, to be fair, that the box has tipped, but um, it, we've got this thigh is consistently coming forward. Okay. okay. So now what I'll, I'm going to do. Grip and try again. Okay, yeah, we'll have another go. So push forward. Just be ready to catch in case she <laughs> flips off the back. <laughs> Great. Now I want you to push backwards. Everyone is stronger in the back, believe it or not. You'd think they weren't. What's happening now? She's okay. gone over to the left. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. And halt. <laughs> right. So now I'm going to push you from the side. So, so you resist me pushing you. That's straightened her up. Wow. So do you think this is a good exercise to give her to do initially? Okay, great. And push. She feels much weaker. Yeah, got a lot more. She's gone on crooked. She's gone crooked again now. Really? Yeah. So how could we straighten her from here? What, what's, where's the weakness? I threw the right hip. Through the right hip. Mm. Okay. So this phase is just showing you uh, how to take a template. Uh, which is very very simple but you can see what I've done is just let her lower herself onto that piece of corrugated cardboard because if they start sliding on it it will make an imprint so we just want them to just drop onto it right so you've got 30 seconds <laughs> 
let's see how many of those tests you can remember because it, it might feel feel to you like I've given you a hundred tests to do but I haven't so the first thing I did was I got the rider to walk away and walk back then what did I do what did the rider have to do or what else can you remember so I had her off the saddle stand and on the saddle stand. Random, anything. Balance coordination. Squats, yeah, good. Put one leg forward and squat, yeah. Walk away, walk back, halt, one leg squats each side, yeah, very good. Um, against the wall, yeah, good. Rib cage central, very good. Leg to hind. <laughs> Uh, back against the wall yeah excellent good and I've got one from the five week group against a wall yeah good aha uh -huh. single leg squat yeah good good walking backwards yeah weighing scales yeah good and I did say maybe this <laughs> Yeah, balance board, well done. And walking backwards, yeah, rock the pelvis when seated. Yeah, you could do that to help them to find their neutral pelvis. Yeah, good, but we'll do that on the saddle stand. Yeah, well done. And static view, yeah, very good, very good. So that we can see how the rib cage fits into the pelvis. I I, I think you've forgotten the, the arm waving, haven't you? <laughs> unless I missed it so destabilize it yeah waving hands circle with hands uh, and drumming yeah you got it you got it yeah great super so there isn't really a ton of tests to do so it doesn't take you long so you know what you're going to get for an assignment don't you <laughs> good let's go on oh seat bone preference yeah okay yeah yeah you can get that yeah uh, pushing from all sides on the block. Yeah, good. Well done. Well done. Is it's uncomfortable for her to get that triangle? So, so uncomfortable where at the front? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's when you ask for the pubic bone contact. Yeah. That it's uncomfortable. Uh, what I'm getting the rider to do there is I want to find out if she's going to um, experience any pubic pain by sitting on that and making an imprint. So uh, what I'm going to ask her to do, I need a pubic bone imprint as well as seat bones. So this is the pubic bone here. And uh, so I need a three point template. And what often happens, and, and many will be, they don't like to admit it, or they don't like to talk about it, but they could experience some pubic pain. So you don't have to say any pubic pain there, dear. <laughs> uh, just say, is that comfortable? Is that uncomfortable? If it's uncomfortable, I'm going to put some padding there. I'm going to make a three point template. I would like, uh, if possible, for you to make contact with the pubic bone. I mean, you can get these. These are a really good prop to have. I know I'm giving you a never ending list of shopping to do, but you can often get these second hand on eBay. I think this was about 20 pounds. You might pay 30. This is a, oh, this is a female pelvis. I, I've got a male one, but this is a female pelvis. If there's a preference, try and get a female one because most of your clients will be female and there is a difference. So I've got a whole skeleton, uh, which is male. But yeah, I, I like to have a, a female. But is it, you don't necessarily have to. If you, get, if you get one for 20 quid and it's male, that's fine. So, you know, that way you can demonstrate with this rather than you know, directly on them. So if they're uncomfortable, you'll put one layer uh, to make them comfortable. And if they're still not comfortable 
add another layer so you can either fold it in half if you've got a big um a big square but you you don't normally need more than about three for most people but it's very important to establish whether they've got that pubic discomfort because those are the ones that are going to have more than likely they're going to have the saddle issues they're the ones who are going to have the positional postural positional issues to avoid that pain so you do you will need to establish whether that's a problem or not but you don't have to get too personal about it it's just are you comfortable are you not does the padding help how much padding do you need okay so uh Oh, yes, so we have someone here. I've got female and male off eBay. Yes, good. Well, um, when's your birthday coming? You, you could get a pelvis for your birthday or for the uh, Christmas time. Hip joint abduction. Oh, yes, yeah, that was another test we did. Forgot about that one. Great. Okay, so let's carry on watching this for another couple of minutes. She does actually make a lovely triangle, but the left seat bone's missing. Oh, it's it's not missing, it's, yeah. And this will often confirm what you found in your... Um, yeah. Test. And she makes, she makes a good average as well. I know this is average. She's a good one. So this is all a bit weird, but it's worth it in the end. Take care that they lower themselves onto yes, yes. the um, template. Yes, so that's the procedure for testing the core strength and evaluating the positioning of the seat bones, the engagement of the pubic bone, the pattern that that triangle makes when the rider is seated in the saddle potentially so let's look at neutral pelvis in a little more detail we've said that it's reflexive abdominal core muscle recruitment it's like the body's piece of stabilizing magic and enhanced core strength is a requirement for the maintenance of ideal alignment in all gates Think about the horse that has to adopt a progressively more rigid spine the faster they use their limbs. It requires core strength. Incidentally, I believe I found the neutral pelvis position in the horse, but that's a whole other webinar. It's needed for stability. Reduced core strength means that the rider may find that their progress is inhibited and they may stray into the territory of using coercion to meet their demands. So it's much more effective to educate them to a stable posture than it is to educate them to learn more and more tricks to meet their demands and their horses will thank them for it. Spinal stability is enhanced in neutral alignment. And as stated earlier, all you do is align this up with this. And the muscles will recruit as if by magic. So let's look at that in practice as we are evaluating the rider. If you mildly destabilize the rider and rock them on their seat bones, they usually are able to find that position of neutral pelvis with your assistance. You don't have to do that. Perfectly fine to just ask them to lean backwards and forwards a couple of times till they sense the most contact that their seat bones and pubic bone have with the surface that they're sitting on. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I'm going to just 
slightly push your shoulder mm -hmm. and you've got to resist so it's going to be as if I'm going to push you over but I'm not uh, and you're going to stop yourself so just gently I'll do it progressively so just resist me pushing you and more okay and now I'm going to do the other side that that's interesting because it's fairly weak both sides so I'm going to do it again I just want you to just try a little bit harder that's still a bit soggy yeah and again yeah so you've now you've got more strength on your left side you felt that yeah yeah I'm going to do it again for the right because sometimes when you know what you're doing yeah you, you get some practice now that's interesting because you're stronger through the left might already be dropped in the left seat bone do you feel well, what I've done is that's without her being in the neutral pelvis I've simply tested her on each side although earlier I would have tested her from front to back but for this and for the seat bone imprint we'll just do it from side to side so I've put her on and I've tested and I found she's very weak both sides for a young person and so what I've done is I've tested her again because the first time she may not really have understood what I wanted. So when I've demonstrated it once, I can then go back again and she knows what she's doing so I can test her again. So sometimes you'll have to do it twice, that's all. Okay. Did, what did you feel there, the difference between me pushing you left and right? Oh, when you're pushing me towards the right, yeah. I was holding that better than when you're pushing me that way. Okay, so when I was pushing you that way, yeah, you were holding it a lot better. But it may be that you're sitting more on your right seat bone, so you could be reliant and anchoring with the right and the left. So what I've said there is that uh, it may be that she's sitting more on one seat bone compared to the other so therefore she might be anchoring so that it may be a, a false test because she's using a seat bone to hang on with rather than her transverse abdominal muscles so just be careful how you interpret that but I have got her sitting on her template there so we'll just see what happens Very stable. Uh, spot the risk assessment there. <laughs> Loose horse walking around. Uh, so then I've asked her what, what I can do then is rock her. Now, in COVID times, you probably won't be able to, but she can either rock herself and find the position that she feels the most stable in, according to her pelvic contact, or I can do it. I can sway her backwards and forwards and help her to find that most stable position. So I'm not asking her to recruit anything. I'm just saying, let's get stable, which will coincide with her recruiting those muscles. The rider is now going, she said she's tilting forwards. The rider, unless I take a picture at this moment and show her the picture, the rider feels like she is massively pitched forwards. Well, that's just her muscle feedback. Uh, and she's not used to sitting like this. And she's, uh, she's actually sitting now on her bony triangle. Now, I think she looks very effective there. <laughs> but she is this is where the rider is going to start saying I'm uncomfortable I don't like it I can't sit like this I can't ride my horse like this it's purely the information that the proprioceptors in her muscles and tendons are giving her it's saying don't do this uh, it's not right but in, in fact it actually is it's just the feedback from the muscles stay with it I cannot 
push you over now. Do you feel that difference? Yeah. So when you're in neutral, yeah. you are much more stable. Yeah. Do you feel like you're sitting on a triangle? Yeah. When you're neutral. Yeah. That's how it should feel on the horse. So that's in neutral pelvis. And you're quite right, you're tipping. You're very good shoulder hip heel, but I feel like you're there's a I think your pelvis is tilted forward. Not you, because your yeah, upper body's here. great. Yes. It's pushing like my stomach is yes. taking me. Okay. Okay, so did you hear that? She said my stomach is just taking me. That's when you know that she's in the neutral pelvis because her muscles are her abdominal muscles are recruiting and she's just told me that. Now this tilting thing, it may well be my uh, saddle stand, the buck. So <laughs> I'm not going to put too much emphasis on this because this is, uh, you know, it may be different for every rider because it's just a different, um, an unlevel surface anyway. But you know, it's it's still good to use it. Okay. And my bum's slightly out. So if you just pop off. See the two seat bones there, and the pubic bone here. But but you're off centre. But it could yeah. be more just the way you were sitting. So she's quite narrow through the. So I've said that she's quite narrow through her seat bones. Um, she's so hotter. <laughs> well, it, you're not going to want to sit on a wide seat. Yeah. You're going to want the narrow ones. Yeah. Um, but she's small. So, and not pushing as much so it's important to get that seat bone imprint now just um here's something you might have learned when you were uh, in junior school <laughs> or nursery school is it easier to balance on two points or three is it easier to balance on a tripod rather than just having um, a chair with, with two, two legs on it. Okay, yeah, tripod, 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 yeah. So you might think that your bony triangle <laughs> here, here, and here, you might think that it doesn't matter that you've been told for so many years that you have to sit on your seat bones, that it just doesn't matter. But physically, when you get into this position, a three point, three bony point seat, then you, you're going to be more stable, even if it's really subtle. When you're moving on a moving horse or you're trying to stabilize on a moving horse this triangle really does matter so we, we'll explore that in the session after the next one so physics tells you that if you get stable on a tripod then you're going to be more stable than just making contact with the seat bones and rolling around, even though you think now I've got a lot of muscle and I've uh, some of us have got a little bit of fat there, that, st that muscle and fat doesn't stabilize you. Bone, a three point bone, uh, not the coccyx, a three point bony triangle is stabilizing. Okay, let's just go on a bit more. Right. Uh, I feel I am forward a little bit. Yeah, you are, you are. I'm not as much. Yeah. Okay, see if you can get on that triangle in the middle of the saddle. Yeah. You're there? Yeah, but something you've got pelvic tilt forward. Very slight. Yeah. But there's definitely an issue. Okay, so what you saw there was that we tested her on the uh, saddle stand without the saddle. We've tested her core strength. We've taken a template. What I've then done is I've put her in her saddle. <laughs> and this is where you'll find saddles just do not fit the rider. Well, they might fit, but let's say, let me say they're not gonna fit the precision rider in every case because 
the saddle hasn't been fitted for the precision rider and you may find that if it's a, a deep seat it holds them in position there's these great big knee blocks etc but it's not just that it could be the twist the rails or, or the rider that was the that had pubic discomfort these are the ones that when you ask them to make a bony triangle in their saddles they can't so they're the ones that are going to tip off that so you can have that discussion with them <laughs> unless you've sold them the saddle but yeah this is where generic saddles do not work for everybody this is where as i said that rider has got a almost a child size pelvis and she's, she's 22 in this 23 but she needs a small saddle but at least you can say ah with this size of uh, bony triangle you will get, and also with the shape of the bony triangle but we'll do that next time you can determine whether she fits in the average category or whether she doesn't because it's the riders who have got the problems that they they bring their problems to you and and it's hard for them to to ride and balance and so on and so on so let's just go on for another moment there's no questions So you can actually see, and we did identify that she had a sore hip. You can see just a slight collapsing there. So just looking at her position there. And we'll see how it progresses over time, over several sessions. This is a couple of months down the line. She's getting more stable and even more perfecting that true shoulder hip heel alignment because we've corrected her rotations. And I've put a pad under her femur here. Again, even better. She's improved. Your right shoulder is her very balance. Good. Just see. Yeah, you're very straight now. Very slight on the right, but it's so slight. Okay. Right, and if you just step forward a bit and I'll just see your alignment from the side. And this is several months later, improved. Yeah, really good. Very good. And just walk away. Gaps I fairly good. In your waist. Much Symmetrical. Better. And back again. Yeah, much better. There we go. Yeah, improved. Wave a lot. This and is good. Wave a lot. That is so stable. That's amazing. Okay, great. Just lift it away slightly without flexing. Like that. Yeah. So slowly away. And good. The right one. Great. And Symmetrical. The one again. Good. Another right one again. Good very good uh, i'm just going to test test your core just from the side so if you resist as i push you that's very strong and this side very strong and from the back so just resist as i push you and then resist again yeah very strong all around uh could you Put yourself in a position so that you're on your triangle or do you do that naturally yeah, now? Yeah, I'm on my triangle. You are on your triangle. Okay, that is marvellous. Let's see what happens when you drum with that. So, quite vigorously 
it's quite hard to destabilize you that's amazing yeah okay great do you want more padding under the right seat bone or less? no i feel i feel now that we've got the two you've got um, right okay that's good could you do the drumming again quite vigorously yeah a little less stable in that interesting okay that's fine and so triangle yeah so last time we did this your pelvis was tipped forward but it seems better now yeah and have you got that straight away no no do you feel like you have to move to get your triangle yeah. Okay, or do you feel like I have to move the saddle? Does it need coming? Sure it's the saddle because I feel like I still need to go the saddle left. How does that feel? I've got my triangle. You've got your triangle. Okay, so if you. So obviously, uh, this saddle is not fitted to this saddle stand. It's not the horse. It wasn't fitted to that. So um, you may have to address the horizontal balance of the saddle then see what happens to the rider because there's no point asking them for feedback if you've put them in a saddle that is not horizontally balanced so then you might start playing with the pads again so i had one pad under her seat bone there and just playing with them really seeing what happens when i put one there take it away put two there and so on there's no exact science to this is just what we try. You just uh, put your hands uh, as if you were riding, as if you were holding the reins. Okay. Still, your foot tends to come forward a little bit. Yeah. Just bring your yeah foot back a little. Okay, that's fine. And you've got your triangle. now you can see the difference that she's able to use her lower leg more and the ultima is a much more stable picture and she's better able to position her ankle joint to help with her proprioception and stability of the pelvis and as she stated earlier she now naturally finds this neutral pelvis or for her it's the description of a triangle that helped her and the more she does this the more natural it becomes to her I have not sent her off to the gym. I have not sent her to Pilates. I've identified her rotations and I've asked her to work on them in the saddle. Obviously, I'll be showing you that in the session after the next session.